Your brain is the most powerful piece of machinery you own, but it's likely that it's the least cared for as well. When was the last time you took it in for an oil change? In fact, I'm betting you don't even know how it works. Well, join the club. Luckily, we've got John Medina, a developmental molecular biologist focused on the genes involved in the human brain development and the genetics of... Wait a minute, who writes this stuff? He's a doctor and he knows more about the brain than almost anybody on the planet. So there. What you're going to learn in the next 12 minutes are the things you need to know in order to get your brain into tip-top shape. Rule number one. Get off your ass. I mean, exercise. Just in case you aren't motivated to be on top of your game so you can rule the world, how about taking care of your brain so that you don't die too soon? As it turns out, exercise isn't only good for your heart, it's good for your brain too. Studies have shown that your lifetime risk for both dementia and Alzheimer's are cut in half if you exercise on a regular basis, even in modest amounts. So that's the first thing you need to know about your brain. It wants you to exercise so you don't die. Back in the day, when we were roaming around the Serengeti and grunting while we were hunting for food, we used to walk an average of 12 miles a day, which means our bodies evolved on a heavy diet of exercise. We simply weren't built to sit in front of a computer at a desk for eight hours at a time. So what will this exercise do for you? It increases the flow of oxygen into our system, which cleans up toxic chemicals left behind by food metabolism. Can you imagine how hard Kobayashi's system has to work to clean up 63 hot dogs? It also stimulates the protein that keeps the neurons connecting. All to say that if your brain stays healthy, you stay healthy. Brain rule number four, pay attention. People don't pay attention to boring things. A shocking discovery, I know. Next, you'll be telling me that the people have short attention spans too, won't you, Captain Obvious? Yes, that's true as well. What's important here, however, is that the more attention the brain pays to something, the more elaborately the information gets encoded and stored in your memory. Additionally, emotionally arousing events tend to be remembered better than neutral events. This has big implications for those who want to get their message across. Think back to the last time you were in a classroom, except this time the teacher didn't take the lessons from Ben Stein, Bueller, Bueller. They took them from Dr. Medina. Here's what you'd experience differently. Number one, they'd start off with something that causes an emotional reaction related to the topic. For me, the scene at the end of Rudy where he gets the call to join the team and then he sacks the quarterback, well that would work. Number two, they would start off with a general overview so you could connect the dots along the way. For evolutionary reasons, you and I don't tend to fill our brains with detailed minutia, but generalized pictures of concepts or events. It's tough to keep somebody's attention if they don't know how it relates to the big picture. Number three, in each 10 minute section, they would concentrate on a single point. Why? Because we tend to tune out after 10 minutes. That's when it's time to check back in and make things interesting again. Lastly, they wouldn't let you play on your cell phone or talk to your friends during the presentation. Why? Because you simply can't do more than one thing at a time, no matter how much you believe you can. In fact, People who are interrupted take 50% longer to complete tasks and make 50% more mistakes while doing it. So, your teacher wasn't just being an egomaniac by forcing you to listen, they were helping you to learn. Okay, so maybe they're a little bit of an egomaniac as well. But the point is, they were helping you learn better. Rule number five, repeat to remember. 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 You get it? This is an important one. 
You're watching this because you want to learn something, right? Well, here are three interesting facts about improving your short-term memory. First, the human brain can only hold about seven pieces of information for less than 30 seconds. So essentially, our memories are a little bit stronger than a goldfish, but not much. That first 30 seconds also determines whether or not you'll remember what you just learned. So if you want to remember the name of that tall drink of water you just met at the party, you need to keep saying his name. That's why networking experts will tell you, always use somebody's name at least three times during your initial discussion with them. Mark, where did you get that lovely Howling Wolf t-shirt? It's simply delightful. Secondly, and puzzlingly, the more elaborate the information you choose to encode, the easier it is to remember. For instance, Mark was wearing a ridiculously Howling Wolf t-shirt and told me that he still lives at home even though he's 42 years old. It's better than, Mark, that guy from accounting. It's the same idea when you create a sentence to help you remember an acronym, like never eat shredded wheat, which aside from being stunningly good advice, has helped millions of people around the world remember the four directions of the compass. It's more information, but for some reason, it's easier to remember. One of the best ways to elaborately encode something new you've learned? Do something with the knowledge. Take an action. It will force you to add something memorable to the learning. Third, you remember best when you're in the same environment as you were when you learned the information. So technically, if you were watching this video so that you'll perform better at work, you'll want to be watching this at work. Weird, but true. So once again, do something with the knowledge at work and do it now. Not next week, because that would be too late. Rule number six, repeat to remember. Quick, what kind of shirt was Bob wearing? That's right, that was a trick question because his name was Mark. Well done, Grasshopper. So you've remembered that for a good minute or so, but guess what? It takes years to cement a short-term memory into the long term. And the key for doing this is repetition over time with specific intervals. Let's think back to your school years again. If you were anything like me, you would probably crammed for your final exams. They seemed to work quite well because I got pretty good grades, especially in my math classes, which was my major boring. So I take a test, get an A, and feel pretty damn proud of myself for how smart I was. Fast forward a few years, and I can't even add up my golf score without making a mistake. I guess the joke was on me. You see, I did absolutely nothing to encode it into my memory, and so now it's gone. Just like all of those years of French. Gone. Tout de suite. How would you incorporate this concept into your learning? Allow for periods of reflection after you've initially learned the material. For instance, if you and I had studied consistently over the semester, we would have allowed the information to stew around in our brain and start to form a semblance of a memory. We probably should have also been a part of a study group that discussed the material because conversations with others will force us to connect more dots than we otherwise might have. What would be a really stupid thing to do if we wanted somebody to learn for the long term? Give them an assessment immediately after they've learned the material. It means absolutely nothing. Rule number seven, sleep well, think well. I'd like to rename this rule, get your ass to bed now. Fascinating fact, when we are sleeping, our brain is not resting at all. In fact, it uses more energy while you're sleeping than it does when you are awake. However, for about a million and one reasons, you need to get your sleep. Think about it. From an evolutionary perspective, sleep puts us in an incredibly vulnerable position. Just ask the poor people who find themselves face to face with a grizzly bear at some entrance to their tent. Thus, we must be doing something pretty damn important while we're sleeping. So what happens when we don't get our sleep? It decreases our ability to pay attention. It decreases our working memory. It lowers our quantitative skills and logical reasoning. It puts us in a terrible mood, and it even affects our motor skills. In fact, studies have shown that going 21 hours without sleep 
is the same as being legally drunk. And legally drunk is good for having fun, if that's your thing, but not so good for learning. So how much do you need? There's no hard and fast rules, but if you wake up feeling like you need more sleep, you probably do. You could also probably use a good cat nap around 3 in the afternoon, right at the 12 hour mark from the midpoint of your sleep. If your boss wonders why you've put in your earplugs and you have your head planted firmly on your desk, you can regale her with this study. A 26 minute nap was shown to improve NASA pilot's performance by 34%. Sure, your job description probably doesn't include flying a space shuttle, but it does include using your brain. Rule number eight, stressed brains don't learn the same as non-stressed brains. Apparently, our brain is built to deal with stress that lasts about 30 seconds. Like the stress you feel when you're faced with a saber-toothed tiger, or coming home after work and realizing that you left the toilet seat up in the morning. The stress response in our body was designed in order to actually get our muscles moving and get us out of harm's way. In these types of situations, your brain will actually perform better. However, our brain isn't designed to deal with long-term stress where we feel like we have no control over the situation. Like dealing with a coworker who constantly belittles you. In these situations, your brain can actually shrink. Stress on the brain is kind of like George Costanza being in the pool. It also damages your memory, weakens your immune system so you get more sick more often, disrupts your ability to sleep, and makes you more susceptible to depression. This kind of stress sucks, big time. Also, keep in mind that the same brain you use at home is the same brain you use at work. So, if your home life stinks, you're going to perform poorly at work. Conversely, if your work life stinks, your home life will suffer the consequences. The advice? Find ways to get rid of bad stress. Eliminate it from your life. It's not good for you. Rule number nine, stimulate more of the senses at the same time. Yes, stimulation is a good thing. This is how your brain works. We absorb information through our different senses. So when you're meeting Mark for the first time and we're seeing his wolf shirt, hearing the sounds of the music that's playing, you know, uh, a little GNR if I had anything to do with it. Smelling the, well, I think you get the picture. The brain then takes those signals, disperses them through the different parts of the brain, then reconstructs the event, eventually perceiving it as a whole. Fascinating stuff. Do you remember what we talked about earlier? Well, of course you do. The more information we encode with the memory, the more we remember the experience. And because our senses are being encoded as separate inputs, this counts as more information. So how much does this impact our ability to retain the memory? This is one of those situations where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. There's an enormous link between this finding and the learning. You'll have more recall with better resolution that lasts longer. The link is evident even 20 years later. Rule number 10, vision trumps all other senses. Guess what? You are incredible at remembering pictures. And so am I. And so are the six billion or so other people who share this fine planet with us. Don't believe me? Here are the cold hard facts. If you hear a piece of information, for instance, my description of Mark earlier in the video, three days later you remember about 10% of it. But because we added a picture to the mix, you're going to remember 65% of that description. So if pictures truly are worth a thousand words, what kind of things do we pay attention to in those pictures? We pay attention to color. We pay attention to orientation. We pay lots of attention to size. And we pay very special attention to an object in motion. So the next time you pick up a book or a PDF or anything in written form without supporting visuals, 
that help explain what the words are on the page, you've been cheated out of a true learning opportunity. Oh, and racially diverse stock photography doesn't count as a visual aid in understanding. Okay? That wraps up the summary. Remember, if you want to learn these principles and keep them in the long-term memory, be sure to watch this again, then put it into action, and come back to the summary a few more times during the next few weeks. If you want to catch the rules that we didn't have time to get to here, well, you're just going to have to go buy the book. Hi, I'm Rhonda, and this is an exclusive audiobook video recorded for the Audiobook Master Channel. Enjoy your audiobook and have fun learning. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button so you'll get updated on our next upload. If you liked the video, give us a thumbs up and say your thoughts about the book we just covered. Do you want to listen to a summary or review of a book that we haven't covered in the past? Say it in the comments below or send us a message. Don't forget to check our other uploads. Enjoy listening!